Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to Tracy as well uh, and to Seifu for the opportunity to present uh, the, the research we've done recently on Compilobacter. So I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully this will work. Uh, can everybody see the presentation? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Dick. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not sure the camera is turned off there. Is the camera turned the off? The camera's still on, Dick. It's still on, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. And now, and okay, now I'll share again. Okay, that's better. Now, hopefully, you can all see that. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, as Mairead said, my name is uh, Dr. Declan Bolton, and I work as a microbiologist in the food safety department in based in Dublin and Ashtown uh, in Chagosk. Uh, and for those of you who don't are not familiar with Chagosk, it's the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority. And I'm going to present an update on Campylobacter. Um, so by way of an overview, okay, it's a bit slow there, changing slides. Um, the most, um, the overview then I'm going to present the in Late uh, last year, uh, the European Center for Disease Control and EFSA published their annual zoonosis report. So I'd like to present some of the data from that report that's relevant uh, to Compilobacter. And also some very interesting baseline uh, survey data. So it'll be uh, the, the survey that was done in across the EU in 2008 and how, uh, how things have improved in Ireland. Um, we have a, a date from 2017, 2018. Then I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Compilobacter control, what the scientific research is telling us. Um, then to present some of the new research uh, in Chagosk uh, that we've undertaken in collaboration with our colleagues, uh, Professor Paul White in UCD and our colleagues in um, Munster Technological University. And then to talk a little bit about biosecurity because biosecurity is still the state of the art. So to start off then, in the most recent ECDC um, EFSA annual zoonosis report, which covered 2020, uh, we were told that there was just over 120, nearly 121,000 confirmed cases of Campylobacteriosis across the EU. And that resulted in a recorded 8,605 hospitalizations and 45 deaths, which surprised me a little bit. However, um, as the vast majority of cases go unreported, um, EFSA actually estimated the total number of compilobacters across compilobacter infections across the EU per annum is about a quarter of a million. And that costs an estimated 2.4 billion euro in terms of uh, lost working days and health care costs. It's interesting also to note that when they did the trend analysis for the last five years, so from 2016 to 2020, um, the number of confirmed cases remained reasonably stable over that five year period. Declan, I wonder if I could ask you to go into full presentation mode, if you don't mind. Okay, it's sorry, just, yeah. No, you're fine. It just makes the... Is that better? Perfect spot. Okay, on. that's Lovely. Grand. Thanks, Declan. Okay. Okay, so in January 2018, the process hygiene criteria for Compilobacter uh, came into effect in the EU. And the objective of this was to uh, was the monitoring of Compilobacter on broiler carcasses and the control uh, through corrective action when the mandated targets were breached. From January 2020, so a 15 out of the 50 samples or more had Compilobacter counts uh, greater than 1,000 um, CFU, colony forming units per gram of neck flap, then uh, corrective action had to be taken. From 2025, if memory serves correctly, from the 1st of January 2025, that will go down to 10 out of 50 samples. And the, the corrective actions then would include uh, actions like reviewing the process controls, looking at the good hygiene practices within the slaughter plant, um, looking at critical operations such as defeathering and evisceration, um, where you tend to get a transfer of compilobacter from uh, feces and, and uh, ingesta and sequel contents onto the carcasses. So um, baseline survey, the, the, the public health criteria provides a good context, I think, for the baseline surveys, uh, the first of which was taken in 2008. And this was across the whole of the EU at the time. And Ireland, um, certainly the Republic of Ireland didn't fare too well because um, approximately 84% of our flocks were compilobacter 
uh, positive and 98% of our carcasses, um, with 42% of the carcasses having counts that exceed the current public health criteria of 1,000 colony forming units per gram. As part of the Clean Broilers project, our colleagues in UCD and Back Western undertook a baseline survey um, that spanned 2017 and 2018. And they reported that the number of flocks, uh, positive, number of positive compactor flocks was, had reduced to 66%, and 53% of carcasses were positive, with 13% exceeding the uh, 1000 CFU per gram limit. So this obviously represents a, a, a quite a substantial improvement. It's interesting also to note that in the ECDC EFSA annual diagnosis report that I mentioned previously, the 66.3% of the carcasses tested by DAFM by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in Ireland in that period were compilobacter positive with 10.7% uh, above the public health, uh, the process hygiene criteria. So they're very similar to the findings that, um, of UCD and Backwestern. Um, in the same year, the, it's, it's just interesting to note that the uh, FBO testing, the food business uh, organization testing, so the testing that was done in the private labs, uh, suggested the contamination rate was as low as 37.8%, so again, significantly lower than the official testing uh, for carcasses, uh, with 7% exceeding the 1000 CFU per gram limit. So I guess the message from this slide is while there has been a huge improvement in terms of the levels of the prevalence of Compilobacter in broiler flocks in the Republic of Ireland and subsequently on carcasses, um, the 2020 EU average, the reported average was 38.7%. So there's still uh, some way to go to get down to that, that uh, target figure. So the next thing I'd like to talk about then is animal sources of Compilobacter, because this is something, an issue that comes up quite often. Um, specifically, I want to talk about animal and food sources. So this table is taken from that um, EU annual diagnosis report for 2020, uh, and shows that the number of members it shows the number of member states reporting. It also shows the number of samples tested and the number of, of samples that were uh, po positive, sort of percentage of positive units. And it's clear from the table that broilers, turkeys, pigs, uh, sheep, and wild boar are major sources of Compilobacter. So I often get asked as to why. Um, pigs are pork products then, uh, and lamb are not a, a major source of uh, compilobacteriosis, so infection in humans. But something happens during um, pigs, there's a different chilling used in pig and pig and, and lamb carcasses as opposed to poultry carcasses. Um, so they're not as big a food safety concern because during the, the chilling of the carcasses, um, compilobacter, which is very sensitive to desiccation, dies off, um, where that doesn't occur on poultry carcasses. Interesting to note as well that 15% of cats and dogs were also compilobacter positives, and a similar percentage of uh, wild birds also carried the bacteria. So in terms of food sources, then, the first part of this table uh, shows the ready-to-eat foods, and there's nothing to report here really, although it was surprising to see that milk was contaminated, albeit less than 1%. For the, the non-ready-to-eat foods, uh, broilers and turkey meat at 30.5% and 21.5% contamination um, stand out. It was also interesting to note that 3.7% uh, of pig meat was also contaminated, uh, bearing in mind what I've just said about um, pig, meat not, pig meat not usually being a, a source of Compilobacter infection in humans. So moving on then to talk about Compilobacter control. Um, and I'd like to present an overview of the current status of the different control activities that have been and are being researched um, and there have been reported in the uh, published papers. And the first of these is reduced slaughter age. And this was suggested in the EFSA opinion in, in Compilobacter opinion published in 2011. Uh, and there's actually a more recent uh, opinion published in the last couple of years. Um, previous work has also shown that a twofold increase in uh, that you achieve a twofold increase in flock uh, positivity after 42 to 44 days and a fourfold after uh, 48 to uh, 61 days. So the older the birds, the more likely they are to have contamination, which is sort of common sense when you consider there's more opportunity to for Compilobacter to access the broiler house. Um, meanwhile, there's work done by uh, Van Wagenberg um, and his colleagues that estimated a 10 to 18% reduction in Compilobacteriosis would be achieved if all boilers were sort of started by 34, 35 days or less. And in Ireland, uh, that would be the norm. Most birds would be harvested by that term. So the problem here is that the harvesters are bringing Compilobacter into the house and work done in, in our own group and elsewhere has shown that the stress hormones in the 
in the birds actually promote the growth of Combilobacter within the uh, broilers. They also activate the genes encoding for the virulence factors. The second um, suggestion or second area of control that's been researched is to discontinue uh, tinning. Um, tinning is a major source of Combilobacter in flocks and numerous papers have shown that over and over again. Indeed, in our own group, we've demonstrated that in the Republic of Ireland, um, all second and subsequent uh, tins or harvests are heavily contaminated with Campylobacter. And again, this is the, the harvesters are bringing Campylobacter into the house. Um, uh, George Giev et al. estimated that at least one third, uh, 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 that you get at least a one third reduction in heavily contaminated flocks if there was no tinning. Um, but for commercial reasons, um, this may not be um, a viable option. Bacteriophage, now essentially bacteriophage, well, all since COVID-19, we've all become experts on, on viruses and virology. And bacteriophage, if you like, they're viruses that infect bacteria. So in this case, it's, it's, it's they're viruses that in, in essence would give the, uh, that would attack the Campylobacter and destroy the bacterial cells. Now with bacteriophages, a number of trials have been reported. And if the broilers are inoculated too early in the production cycle, you get the development of a subresistant population. So while you get a population crash in the Campylobacter, there's a subresistant population develops, and then that grows out and colonizes the birds. Um, there is, it has been suggested that a bacteriophage could be applied immediately before slaughter, um, but there may then be issues with consumer acceptance, particularly post COVID. Would you accept food that has been deliberately in inoculated with a, a, a virus, uh, even though it doesn't affect humans? The next area is vaccination. Um, now, the minimum requirement for a vaccine to induce uh, is that it induces immune response that would protect the birds against Campylobacter jejuni and coli. Um, it has to be easily administered uh, and be cost effective and safe. And there are a range of different candidates and several have shown promise, but none are commercially available yet. Feed and water additives then for, so a number of different feed and water additives, organic acids, um, medium chain fatty acids, bacteria sands, and probiotics have all been tested. Um, probiotics um, may reduce Campylobacter carriage, but the results in the literature are inconsistent. Um, bacteria sands, a number of bacteria, uh, such as Lactobacillus salivarius and Enterococcus durans and Enterococcus hirae are known to produce um, these peptides, which have anti Campylobacter activity, um, but there's no commercially available product just yet. Um, a, a lot of research then is focused on organic and medium chain fatty acids. Um, these work very well in laboratory experiments where the testing is done in water. So you expose the Campylobacter to the organic and the medium chain fatty acid in water, but they don't work so well in broilers. And even when reductions have been achieved in broilers under commercial conditions, um, this has not necessarily resulted in a lower Campylobacter count than the subsequent carcass. There's also a lack of consistency in terms of the results. Um, and even mixtures that have shown initial promise have had no effect in the medium to short term. So that's where the research is currently at on organic acids, and I'll talk a little bit, about, bit more about that when we talk about the research we've completed ourselves here recently. So in terms of the new research then, and I actually want to go back a little bit and start with a study we did in 20, published in 2017, because I think it's a very important study. So um, we had done work that previous research or research that's actually published in this paper had where we uh, tested a, a range of different sites, actually 12, 20 different sites on, a, on several different Campylobacter farms, commercial farms, um, after cleaning and disinfection. And we found that 12 of those sites um, were contaminated with Campylobacter. And so that obviously introduced the possibility of carryover of Campylobacter from a previously infected flock to the new birds that were coming in. And what's particularly worrying was that uh, one of the sites that was contaminated were the feeders and drinkers. Um, and if you, for those of you that work in the industry, you'll, you'll realize it's, it's actually very difficult to clean, particularly the feeders, they're not designed to be cleaned. Um, they're, they're very difficult. There's areas you cannot reach. The areas where Campylobacter can access because the Campylobacter would be carried on the air and so forth in, in, on the, in, the, in the broiler house. So in this study, we evaluated the six most commonly used disinfectants for cleaning feeders and drinkers. And we found that only two were effective. And they were a mixture of potassium peroxy monosulfate, sulfamic acid, and sodium chloride at a 5% volume over volume uh, concentration and applied by fogging. So by fogging, we can access all the areas, particularly in the feeders and the drinkers. And also a formulation of deuteraldehyde and quaternium ammonium complex at 0.3% volume over volume, also um, applied by fogging. So interesting 
interesting to note that if farmers are not using that, if they're using any of the other um, commercially available um, disinfection and sanitation products, they will not be effectively cleaning the broiler houses and the equipment, etc. The, the second study uh, was actually published last year, and we investigated the survival and our growth of compiler bacteria jejuni in the broiler digestate prepared from the different feeds, the starter, the grower, and the finisher feeds. And we did this in the laboratory. So we're able to uh, artificially digest. There's a, a number of publications that describe how using um, or, uh, or organic acids, uh, not organic acids, um, uh, acids, non-organic acids and um, particular enzymes, you can actually mimic the digestion process in the birds. And I guess we were, we knew that Compilobacter has uh, extremely complex requirements as compared to say Salmonella or, or E. coli. They cannot grow using glucose as an energy source or other carbohydrates, for example. And they also cannot produce essential amino acids such as spart as aspartate, glutamate, porcine and serine. So these must be provided in the environment if they're to grow. And Interestingly, none of our digested feeds supported the growth of Compilobacter. Indeed, they didn't even support the survival of Compilobacter. So there wasn't even enough nutrient released by the digestion process to maintain the, the Compilobacter population. And none of the bacterial cells were detected after uh, 15 hours. So based on our observations, we speculated that the digestive action of the chicken's gut alone was not enough to release the nutrients required, but the action of other bacteria uh, within the gut uh, must be facilitating the growth of Compilobacter. So in other words, other bacteria are breaking down the feed and that's releasing the nutrients, the, the um, intermediates of the TCA cycle and the amino acids and so forth that are required by the Compilobacter to grow. And that will go some way, would go some way to, to um, explaining how we can, how we observe very high levels of Compilobacter in the Sika, up to uh, a million, 10 million, even a hundred million bacteria per gram of sequel material, even though Compilobacter is a poor competitor. So this year we also published a study which examined the effect of organic acids, medium chain fatty acids and essential oils on Compilobacter in the laboratory. So this relates to the, the, what I said earlier on in terms of the organic acids and the medium chain fatty acids. So as with previous studies, uh, we found that these were effective uh, when tested in the laboratory in water in Muller Hinton agar, which is just an agar that's used for growing bacteria, and also in the digestate that I previously mentioned. Now, obviously, the digestate presents a, quite a significant challenge because there's plenty of places for the Compilobacter to hide. So based on preliminary results, we formulated three different mixtures um, of organic acids, of medium chain fatty acids, and of essential oils um, at the most effective concentrations de determined in the laboratory. And then we went and we tested these in a commercial flock. Now, Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, the flock did not actually turn Compilobacter positive. So we don't actually know what the effect of these, um, these um, mixtures were on Compilobacter carriage, which was the objective of the experiment. However, as with all great discoveries, we discovered by accident, if you like, because unlike other studies, we monitored broiler performance. And we found that all the treatments resulted in a, a considerably slower weight gain uh, or performance. Um, so that, that's a new dimension in terms of the research that's previously been published on these um, water additives or feed additives, that it's, it's not sufficient just to do the work in the laboratory and, and even to do the work under commercial conditions. You have to also assess how these will affect um, the, the time it takes for the broilers to grow um, um, from a commercial, but also from an animal welfare uh, point of view. And the final study I want to present for the moment, uh, and this relates to the, the previous comments I made about Campylobacter in the, the broiler needing the action of other bacteria to release nutrient from the feed. Um, this study is in the process of being in, uh, published and it investigated the effects of antibiotics on the microbiota, which is just basically the, the, the microorganisms that are in the, the gut of the broiler, um, specifically in the lower, middle and upper GIT. Uh, at different stages throughout the production cycle. So we had three different stages where we, we took samples. Uh, it was actually corresponded to the change in the, the, the feed over to the different feed types. And we concluded that the antibiotic, which was deoxycycline in this case, even when administered in the first three to five days of production, affected the microbiota throughout the production cycle. So in other words, it, it changed the microbiota within the chicken. And even after the antibiotic treatment was stopped, 30 days later, we were still seeing that altered microbiota in the chicken. We also observed that the microbiota in the three different sections of the, the, the gastrointestinal tract were, uh, were very different. Um, and the microbiota
changed as the birds aged, which I think is quite, quite interesting. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, biosecurity. And biosecurity is still the current state of the art in terms of compiler vector control, despite all the research that's been done and that I've mentioned previously. Um, so it seems a good idea that we spend a little bit of time uh, discussing it. Um, biosecurity is about protecting a population. In our case, it's a population of broilers, um, but it's not a new idea, as is evidenced by the medieval fortifications throughout Ireland and elsewhere. And I think this is Trim Castle. I could be wrong, but I, I think it's Trim Castle. Um, so it's all about, in terms of the, the Compilobacter uh, biosecurity and broiler house biosecurity, it's all about controlled access. Um, so in other words, in the broiler house, you're using hygiene barriers in the anteroom, you're changing outer clothing and boots in the anteroom. Um, you're using specific boots for each house, uh, specific tools for each house, uh, just fly screens to prevent uh, flies and other insects coming in, cleaning and disinfection, etc. And Previous work by our colleagues, by Sean Smith, who is currently working for the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, uh, I did his PhD with Paul White in UCD. Um, Sean's work showed that there was um, clear, he clearly demonstrated there were lower Campylobacter prevalence in farms, in farms with high biosecurity, as opposed to those with lower biosecurity. Um, previous work in our own group had identified farmers as a major source of Campylobacter. And we speculated, we wondered that if we could stop direct contact between the farmers and the birds, uh, could we stop Campylobacter? And uh, hence the biosecurity concept was developed. So as you can see in this picture, the, the, cube, the biosecurity uh, cube um, consists of, it was initially consisted of four perspex walls um, in which the, broil the broilers were stocked at the same concentration. So this was inserted into a commercial flock and the broilers were stocked at the same uh, concentration as the main flock, which are approximately 20 birds per meter squared. And you can see that the studies at the time clearly demonstrated that the broiler, the biosecurity cube worked. So in other words, um, if you look there, T is the test birds and C is the control. So if you look at the, the, the flocks, the upper table there is showing the uh, fecal counts of Campylobacter and the lower table is showing the sequel counts. And you can see that, if, for example, in flock one, the, 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 the test birds, the birds within the, the biosecurity cube actually remained um, negative until day 35. Um, and actually when we went back, the farmer had, had actually stepped into the biosecurity cube coming towards the end uh, at harvest. So that, that explained at first 10, so that explained what had happened there. But the, the control birds, which is 30,000 plus birds all around this biosecurity cube had, had gone positive at day 31, quite uh, day 21, got quite, strongly positive, that's um, 4.5 is an excess of 10,000 Campylobacter per gram of feces. And you can see as we go into flock two, flock three, flock four, and flock five, the patterns are the same, except in those experiments and those studies, the, the birds within the um, biosecurity cube remain Campylobacter negative, like a little island, if you like, surrounded by 30, 35,000 birds that were Campylobacter positive, which is very interesting to, to observe. Um, however, there were issues with the cost of the perspex cube. Airflow is, a, is something that's very important in broiler houses because it's used to regulate the temperature of the birds, particularly to stop the birds getting uh, too warm and suffering from heat stress. So temperature control was very difficult in a, in a cube that has perspex on the sides. So we redesigned the cube testing uh, different barrier materials. And that's what's published in this paper. We tested a range of different uh, barrier materials, and we found that um, essentially what we're testing is, is these different materials attached to a galvanized steel frame. And I'll show you a photograph in a second. Um, we found that polyurethane film uh, or fly screen were both effective at um, keeping compil the Campylobacter out, even when the flock turned positive. Um, and the key here is that in addition, the, while the cube is stopping uh, the direct contact between the farmer and the birds, um, the, 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 these materials are stopping direct contact between the birds that are outside the cube and the birds that are inside the cube. Um, and the latest version of the biosecurity cube actually looks like this. Uh, and again, this has been extensively tested. Um, we had up to eight of these produced and up to eight in different uh, uh, commercial farms. And we tested it, them in three different flocks. And in each case, the, the, the birds outside turned positive while the birds inside remained Campylobacter negative. So that's what it looks like. Um, 
the a follow-on study from then from that was that we had observed that the birds within, although it wasn't an objective of the study, we had observed that the birds within the flock within the biosecurity cube seem to be growing quicker than the birds outside. And um, there's a number of different reasons for this. And when I've presented this work before, uh, I've been told that there's uh, one of the key things about um, chickens is that their natural their the natural pecking order is only established when you've 200 birds or less so when you put a bird into a, a house with 30,000 or 35,000 birds it, it, there's a lot there's a lot of stress there because the bird there's no pecking order because there's just too many birds so within the cubes they I'm told they can establish a pecking order and that that is more instinctively that's better for the birds they also decide the cube provide a nice roosting area for them so they tend to, to roost against the side of the cube. Um, and it's possible as well that we know evidence that, is that they don't move around as much when they're within the cube. So when they're within the cube, they have exactly the same access, exactly the same access to the feed and water as the birds outside the cube. So we've that calculated um, based on the, the stocking density of the birds. So we decided we'd undertake an experiment to see uh, the effect of uh, stocking density. Um, where we'd monitor and the effect, not just of stocking density, but the stocking density within the cube and outside the cube, but also uh, to compare if we have the same stocking density inside and outside the cube to measure what the difference in growth rate would be. Uh, and this, this, this study was published in 2021. And so, it can, it, so we try different stocking densities, both within and outside the cube, um, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22 birds per uh, meter cubed. And we found that uh, 20, 20 birds per meter, per meter squared, 20 birds per meter squared was the optimum stocking density. So we're not just taking the birds at 12, obviously grew faster, but if you were to uh, upscale that to the entirety of the house, you'd have less birds in the house. So this, this is, uh, the optimum terms from a commercial perspective, not just from um, the food safety perspective. Birds rather than the cubes grew faster and they were generally healthier. So by generally healthier, uh, um, we looked at uh, foot pad lesions, there were none. Uh, we looked at uh, feather formation, they had much better uh, feather formation and feather definition. Um, and I think as a result of this, they achieved a target weight of two kilograms, uh, three to six days faster than the control birds. So this was really interesting from our point of view. Um, so, for example, what does this mean then? from a commercial point of view, if you had a five day turnaround, and I know not too many farms in the Republic of Ireland had a five day turnaround, although there is some research that suggests a shorter turnaround is better than a long, leaving the house empty for longer. But if you had a five day turnaround, for example, this would uh, allow farmers to produce extra flocks per year, equivalent to a 20 percent increase in productivity. So the, the net result of this is that when we went out to the farms, we were no longer just talking to the farms about compiler back to uh, control. We were talking about um, and public health. We were talking about um, we were talking to the farmers in terms of increased uh, productivity and profit. So I'm going to finish up there. Um, I want to acknowledge that these studies have been funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine in the Re Republic of Ireland, um, who, along with uh, Chagas, as I say, have funded this research. And if there's any questions now, I'll be happy to take them. I think we're going to do the question session at the end.